here with us today. So I'm going to pass this over to Susie. Harry. Okie dokie. Let me share my screen. Okay. Let's see here. Someone else is sharing. Replace the current share. I got it. Let's see. Screen one. And so if we, rem oh, did it share? There you go. So if we remember when we last left off, we had looked at um, two different scenarios. And so we have, like I mentioned, we had a number of scenarios to share with you. So I've picked two more for today, but I thought we would start off with, um, reviewing some of the questions and some of the conversations that are probably going to take place as you're um, determining what the environment is for the preschool age child and how those services will roll out. Um, so um, these are represent some of the IEP team conversations uh, that a district might have as they're thinking about um, how shall we serve this particular child. And so um, in this case, we've determined that the child is eligible and in need of special education. And uh, the IEP team is trying to decide on, is, is probably already written up the present levels and has written up the goals and is in the process of determining what services are necessary and what programming is necessary for the child and the environment in which the child will receive the special education. So um, we are recommending that uh, the IEP team have a discussion about these topics. Where is the child currently? So this is looking at, um, is the child already enrolled in a childcare setting or a Head Start program? Or is the child never been in a program? So um, thinking a little bit about, you know, what that current experience is of that child so that we can um, fold that into the decision making. Um, then also thinking about what does the family want or need, because as we know that um, some children are attending preschool or child care programs already, um, for one reason or another, some, and sometimes it's because the parent is working and needs the, the child care coverage. So we would want to take that into consideration and, and um, you know, value what the family needs as part of the um, decision making. Um, we would also want to look at the programs that are available in the school district community and in the district itself. So there might be a uh, pre-K, the state pre-K program that the district is operating, or it might be some child care um, centers that are available in the community, or there might not be any, or there might be Head Start programs that are in the community. And um, so we would want to really thoroughly um, investigate what are the available opportunities for um, delivering special education services in the existing programs. And as we've been saying, we want to support and highlight the existing um, child care system that, that is uh, in the community and that mixed delivery system. So not really disrupting um, the child care uh, programming that's already available in the um, district areas. We would want to look at um, the options that the IEP team considered and the decisions that the IEP team made around, you know, after a, a discussion and an investigation of all of these um, first four items. So, um, thinking about, well, if we put this together and that together and or we left the child there or we deliver the services here or we were able to um, contract with someone to deliver services, um, the IEP team has that discussion and then makes a decision. And I've changed um, up the order of these a little bit to make it more naturally flow because after that IEP team makes that decision, um, they are able to identify the um, and, and considers all those options or is able to identify the least restrictive environment for that particular child. And then um, we are um, asking people to be familiar with the codes around the environments. 
And then to identify based on the decision that the district made, what are our next steps? What is the district's next steps? What um, enrollment activities have to take place? What services might need to be arranged for, including transportation or um, therapy services? And um, how to arrange for uh, payment of any um, child care that would not be um, the, uh, the responsibility of the parent because of the free appropriate public education aspect. So our first scenario is going to be um, one in which there is a four-year-old child in a Head Start program. The child is attending the Head Start program in this case for 30 hours per week. So let's say it's um, six hours a day, five days a week. And um, the family wants the child to remain in the Head Start program. It is a not a school district program. So in other words, it's a standalone program outside of the district. And, but it is within the district boundaries. And um, the IEP says that the child needs six hours per week of special education services. So those could be instructional activities. Those could be social emotional activities. They could be therapy activities. And um, so all together, all combined, the specially designed instruction for this child is six hours per week. And then the IEP team also says that the child needs a program to get FAPE. So we talked about this last week that um, some children might just need a service, for example, a, um, a service like speech therapy. But in order to be able to um, benefit from that service, there needs to be there may need to be some extended time in order for that child to practice the activities related to um, language and communications development. So a program is um, not only the services, but it's access to um, the setting in which the child can benefit from and um, would be able to meet the IEP goals that were listed on the IEP. And so the IEP team says that the child needs a program in order to get FAPE. So beyond the six hours per week, um, they would need a program. So the district then looks at, well, what, it, what do we have in our district? Well, in this district, we, we run a pre-K program, a state pre-K program. It operates uh, 10 hours per week and it has an extended day option. There are also local childcare programs that are two stars so that meet our um, expectation of, uh, of licensing. And then um, there's also a full day Head Start program and that's where the child is currently attending. So they're looking at all of these different options. Um, the IEP team then makes a decision and says that the child will attend a Head Start program and will be transported back to the district because the two programs are in two separate locations for services and there was no provider to travel to the program. So in this particular district, they didn't have anyone available to deliver that special education service to that child in the Head Start program. And so we, they would provide their special education services in a different, a separate location. Um, the services could be delivered at a therapy setting or the child might attend the district program. So that, that district pre-K program, and it happens to be closer to the parent's home and actually worked out logistically in this case. And um, so no general education funds were needed since Head Start is free and the special education funds would pay for the special education services such as therapy and transportation. So in this situation, the placement that was determined is that the child was eligible and the LRE recommended is a regular early childhood program with the services in a separate location. And the child will be in, in that regular early childhood program more than 10 hours per week, services in some other locations. So there's the code that would be used. And the district would ensure continued enrollment in the Head Start program they would then um, put together an MOU or update the MOU that exists between the district and the Head Start. They would arrange for the transportation and any direct and related services that were gonna be provided in the other location that the child would attend. 
So there are lots of different ways that this might roll out as you imagine, you know, and I'm sure you're 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 possibly thinking about other um things that might have been done or maybe something more likely, a more likely scenario. But in this case, um, this is one that we kind of put together. Um, did anything come to mind when I was talking about this that might have been other options that you would have considered in the location you are in right now in your school district? So of the, the, the people on this meeting that are in, um, that are in cohort one, anything kind of come to mind as some other options? You have a raised hand, Susie. Beth, go oh, ahead. Great, thank you, Beth. So we don't have a Head Start program, so can you just tell me what it would look like if we have a student, let's say, who's in a um, private pre-K that isn't our public pre-K. So the parents are paying tuition for maybe 20 hours a week. And if we determine that a child requires six hours per week of special education um, and are going to deliver that within that setting, do we have any obligation for an early childhood tuition agreement under that circumstance? I think that goes back to the idea of um, the distinction between providing this specially designed education, the services, and whether or not the child needs access to more extended day in order to deliver those services. So if we, if you just had, you know, a speech therapist going in three times a week, and that was three of these six hours, and you had, let's say, an OT going in, I mean, I don't, I don't know, you know, what, what the needs are of the child. Let's just say, an, you know, one hour of transportation and and two hours of um, of occupational therapy, it seems like the IP or the IP team could just say those are the necessary services. But if that's all that's being offered and there's no other supports listed on the IEP, then um, that would be the offer of FAPE. But in many cases, in order for the child to be able to make progress and to meet those goals, and to achieve you know, the progress that the IEP team is, is um, expecting, that there would be additional activities and supports necessary in order for that child to um, uh, achieve the IEP goals that are on the, you know, that are listed. So that might mean more than the six hours, it might mean that the child needs 12 hours. So maybe attending a program three days a week for, um, four hours a day. So two of the special education and two of uh, general education to access the FAPE. And so the district would be responsible for all of the costs associated for uh, delivering the special education for the child to make progress on those goals. So not only the service hours, but the program hours. So that's why it's so important for them to decide and to be able to delineate What's it going to take for this child to make progress on the goals that we've identified that are the needs that he has? And so um, in, and so the district would be responsible for that amount of time. And if you selected less time and they didn't make progress, then the IEP team should be considering maybe we should maybe we need to put more time in there and that would include access to the program and some other supports you know, that could be um, included and listed on the supplementary aids and services that would extend the amount of time and the activities um, identified as necessary for that child to make progress. Okay, thank you. And one other question. Uh, what if a family is currently enrolled in a childcare that doesn't meet the standards for um, the educational setting? And I think that's our next scenario. What? I think that's our next scenario. Well, okay, because I was just going to ask. Then, what do we do if they are if that is the preferred placement for the parents? So I just want to go back to your question. Six hours of SDI is a lot of SDI for someone that age. It would be a lot for a kindergarten student, as you know, Beth. So I just think, um, you know, for me that begs the question of, you know, is the team looking at 
accessing the program or um, to determine that level of service. So I think that, um, you know, when you think about if you, you, you kind of have to stay away from thinking about this is a regular kindergarten class, you know, cause it is a little bit different, but I think thinking about what that child needs to access the programming is the special education service that they need. And then if they need a program to support generalization of skills and access and to practice the skill they're learning, um, that's a different kind of a conversation. So it is different, but six hours a week is a heavy IEP for someone that age who is, um, and that's a lot of time potentially not in program that they could be um, learning along their non-disabled peers. So I just want to put that out there. And I'm so glad we have the scenario of the, the child who is not um, in a at least two-star rating. So that's great. Okay, so great questions and great thinking about that. Uh, these, it's it's uh, complex, but it seems like everybody's getting the hang of it. Um, in this scenario, a four-year-old child is currently attending an unlicensed childcare program. So it is not a two-star program. The family wants to keep the child in that current program that meets for 30 hours per week for one reason or another. And, you know, it might be out of convenience. It might be because other family members are attending there. Um, we don't know, but that's what they want. And then um, on the IEP, it says that this child needs a therapy service two times per week for a total of 60 minutes. So 30 minutes each. And um, the district looks at, well, what do we have in our community? We have a half day program. We have local childcare programs uh, with and without two stars. And so the IEP team decides um, and talks about how the, the IEP team considered the parent preference. However, the program does not meet the criteria for a location for services. It's not two stars. Um, the district offers services outlined on the IEP at their location. And the child will remain in the current child care program and be transported two times per week by the district. The services will be delivered in the therapy office and the district res is responsible for paying for those therapy services. Um, so the placement would be in this case, a regular early childhood program. So we consider all of the time that the child is in, um, we look at whether or not the child is attending any program and we count those hours when we're trying to determine the LRE code. And so in this case, the child is attending a program uh, for um, more than 10 hours per week and the services are going to be in some other location. So the other location would be back in the school district. So this would be the code. And the district would then enroll the child in their school district and arrange for the therapy services and the transportation. So. I want to highlight a couple of things here. Um, one is you're not setting up any kind of contract with this provider because they don't meet the basic criteria of which we have to say, we'd be happy to offer some of your programming um, that we determine as an IEP team is necessary. So there's no contract with these folks. And so what you're doing is you're, it's, not really a parental placement, but it's a little bit more like a parental placement than if the child is in a quality program that's going well for them, right? So I just want um, you to understand that the parent might not have any interest in sending their child somewhere else to have a standalone service. Um, and so that is where you're just going to need to document what you've offered to parents and say, under our guidance, we can't support your child in that program because they don't meet the basic 
quality rating of that program. So that's just some of those are going to be more nuanced conversations because the parent will say, no, thank you. I'm not bringing my child to, uh, you know, a external OT provider that I'm contracting with, you know, so that's just, if those scenarios come up, we would love to have individual conversations around those with you to help provide guidance of even how to document and couch those conversations sensitively, if that makes sense. I see um, Scott has his hand up. Yeah. <clears throat> so my question is, <clears throat> I met with our local child care centers and one of the pieces of feedback they gave us is that they're looking for the providers to offer them some consultation specifically around speech or communication, which we generally do. Is it okay, even if a place isn't two stars, to write a 15 minute consult into the IEP once a month so there can be some carryover for the child? I mean, I think it behooves you to set a good relationship with the parents that you're going to be working with at some point and do what you can preventatively to provide what you can for whatever child is coming your way, you know? So in my opinion, you know, it's kind of like, I remember when I was in New York, Beth, you know, we had privately placed children in a private school and we did a lot as an SAU to support those kids, knowing that at some point they were probably going to be headed our way. And so we gave really good, meaningful consultation. We even sent a speech therapist in there sometimes. That's a district level decision though. And that's a resource level decision. Do you have the capacity to do that? Some of you might not have the capacity to do that. And some of you might, depending on how you're structuring your supports. But I always think we want to have, we want to start off, we know that these relationships with parents are already tenuous in the CDS to SAU transition prior to now. And this is that opportunity you have to really develop a quality relationship and provide what you can, how you can, you know, maybe you have someone who can scoot in for telehealth. I'm not going to tell you that, you know, you shouldn't do that because I think it's going to pay off dividends in the end. Now, are you responsible in a FAPE obligation? No, not really, because they're electing to do something that's not within a minimum standard of what this state is identifying as preschool educational programming. So that is why it is not, not meeting. That's why you're not going to get in trouble legally if the parent says, oh, you didn't meet my FAPE obligation. We said we, because you're gonna document in that written notice. We don't see that childcare that's less than two star quality rating as an, it's not an approved preschool educational setting. And you're electing to continue that even though we don't support that. This is what we will do for you. You can definitely, I have a little speech group happening in my school. If you want to pop in twice a week, you can do those kinds of things. But again, you're not really, it's more like a parental placement at that point. So I just want to, you know, say that, you know, your resources, you know, what you can support, you know, those programs, you know, what you're, you know, some parents are like, you know this is the program I want and that's it. And so you have those conversations and they, um, you know, so I hope that, I hope that clarifies. This right. is a great scenario though, Susie, perfectly timed. <laughs> and Beth had a follow-up question. What if the child does not meet IEP goals in this setting? And that's when you, I would suggest you would go back to the IEP team meeting and talk about, then you're making an offer of where those goals, where that child could access services to make gains on those goals. And that may be the district half day program. You're still going to offer it, even if they're like, no, no, we're not going to, at least you're providing that offer of faith based on the data that you have. And that's kind of what I was saying. It's, it's, you're not violating the FAPE offer because that setting is not what the state of Maine is saying is approved special education preschool programming. I mean, not special, it's proves preschool programming. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I think we should be careful on that about um, when it when the school district makes a recommendation and says for, in, in our estimation, this is the FAPE offer and it includes um, 
a more extensive program than what, you know, so, you know, after the, looking at the progress reports that child's not making progress, they think the child needs more special education service and programming in order to make the progress that we think that the child is entitled to and the supports and services they're entitled to. And the parent then says, no, I'm going to keep them over here. We have to remember that they're not allowed to pick and choose, you know, services. The, the offer of FAPE is made. So that's kind of walking in like a fine line between, um, you know, making that offer of FAPE and then saying, well, okay, well, but we're good with what we're showing right here, even though they're not making progress. So we, I think we would want to be careful about that. If we know that what we've been offering is not enough and we offer something more and the parent rejects it, we need to be pretty kind of careful there about um, and, and really trying to find a way that works for everybody, you know, that's going to be of benefit to the child and um, works for the parent. So the parent has the option to say no um, based on the um, what's offered. So we don't want to offer less knowing that more is what's necessary. And I think there was a hand up too. Yeah. You have another follow-up question? Sorry, I promise I'll try not to monopolize. I, I'm just, so Erin, you do know York and I'm thinking about these two star versus highly rated, very expensive exclusive pre-Ks in York. And if we don't have room in our public pre-K because we've reached capacity and we are, but we are in working with one of the local very fancy pre-Ks, we could find a placement for a child that would meet the, those standards. Is that when an early childhood tuition agreement comes in, if that family, like, because I think the, the equity piece for us in terms of trying to help a family afford a placement like that is going to be very challenging. So I, I'm, I'm, that's the part that I think I'm most confused on is when the tuition agreement takes hold, if we, if we're looking at finding a place, assisting a family to find a placement, whether or not that's transferring or whether or not that's a new placement, because the rates are so high and there's such a discrepancy between our child care versus our pre-Ks. Yeah, that's, that is a tricky question. And I, I know that you have some very expensive um, placements in your area, but again, you are not paying for child care. So if those are child care placements, and we know that child cares offer educational programming, but again, you're really going to look at that FAPE obligation. So you're really going to look at that IEP team process to say, little Johnny needs two hour, an hour a week of speech therapy. And in order to benefit from his and practice those skills and generalize it, we think he needs 10 hours of educational programming to do that. That's where you're gonna be negotiating with your private provider. We're gonna provide 10 hours of this pay, you know, in a, if you have a, if they have, so, and some of our providers, some of our child cares, and this might happen in New York, um, are saying, oh, we only do a half day or a full day rate. And so you might say, okay, we're gonna do, four half day rates and, um, you know, and we'll get this child in for 10 hours and the parent's going to transport them and we're going to push in uh, an hour. So you're not, you know, you're not necessarily paying for an entire, as long as the, um, the program is collaborating with you on that level. Now you may have a program that doesn't want to collaborate with you on that level. And, um, you know, in that instance, you know, I think it's, I, I mean, I do think that our private providers are all wanting to collaborate with SAUs because they want to partner with you and they want to be able to have kids access their programming. And they don't necessarily want you to put an extra wing on village elementary school and take all of their kids away from them. Right. So I just think it's, those are the, I mean, it'd be great. Like with Scott, if you're kind of pre-planning who's in your area, having those conversations and saying, this is what we might be looking at. Um, I just think that um, that might be a helpful way to say, 
you know, these are, they probably have never contracted with CDS. Any of those places have probably never contracted with CDS. So, you know, they probably haven't had a conversation like that. And we'd be happy to send in like a Lori Whittemore with you to have that conversation because she's a pro at that. She's on this call. You're a pro at that, Lori Whittemore. Those conversations, like she's really good at like setting boundaries for those places and making sure it's not a money-making scheme and all of those things. So Susie, you were going to say something. Erin, um, I was just going to add to that is that what I've heard of other um, school districts doing in the past is saving a few seats, knowing, predicting how many kids you're most likely going to get, and then holding a few of those seats, those spots, so saving slots for kids so that you can offer that and not get into the quagmire that you're kind of identifying as, you know, with the other child care programs that are out there. And that way you might have two kids in one slot. You know what I mean? Like, that's a really good idea, Susie. I hadn't thought about that. Really good idea. Uh, we did do that, Erin. And um, my other concern on the back side of that, and you know York, is um, if we're offering it for 30 hours a week for most children and we're finding a child that would benefit from 10 or 12 hours a week and we do have those hours available, I'm just really worried for us in York that we set ourselves up for a FAPE situation when we're not offering the full 30 hours. So that's, that'll be another Are conversation. Are you offering 30 hours to every child in your catchment area? We're only offering 30 hours to every child in our, in our limited public pre-K. And you're so, limited. So what I'm saying is, do you offer every child who's in that age range, a program in your, in your schools? general yeah. education or so then you are not in a you are not in a fate bind there because it's not universal for you great that's the best answer i've had in three months thank you <laughs> I'll, right. actually, I'll actually sleep tonight <laughs> that does sound like a good scenario though to add in uh is to talk about those sau's that um have essentially a lottery which is it sounds like what you have in york um where that's there but making sure that that's really clearly articulated in the scenario well, great job, everybody. And uh, next time, I think we have a couple more scenarios to go over. So I'll let us get back to our uh, regular programming. Thank you, Susie. Jen, can you pop the agenda back up real quick? Absolutely. I think the next item was talking about the superintendent's agreements. Yeah. Um, before we head to that oh, yeah. topic, I'm going to pop in the form for the um, training for the DAISY and the BDI for if those it's an electronic form to fill out. Most of you have filled it out, but just in case some of you haven't seen it yet, I'm just going to put it in the chat and then you can access that during this meeting. Thank you. Back to you, Sandy. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. I just want to say we only have 12 people signed up for those trainings. So I know we have probably more people out there that need the training. So please make sure to sign up your staff that you want to attend that. So um, a couple of meetings ago, you witnessed kind of what happens when we get to a question that we don't quite know how to answer. And we kind of stumbled and we're thinking out loud and trying to process through the question of what happens for our collaborative programs when we have a student attending. So I'm thinking specifically of our districts that are collaborating to have early childhood special education programs. Some of those SAUs are in cohort one, some are not in cohort one. And so the question was, what happens if a student with a early childhood special education student with an IEP is coming from a non-cohort one district to a collaborative program in cohort one. And so it really took all of us to get together. And I mean, a bunch of people, including the commissioner's office and Sarah Forrester and everyone else that is working hard to kind of think this through and come up with a cohort one answer, which means this is the answer that we're providing today for this cohort until we have further guidance 
um, that we are going to change that <laughs> answer. Um, so if you have a student coming into your collaborative program from a non-cohort one school, we are asking that there be a superintendent's agreement between the superintendent where that child lives and the cohort, the collaborative program that's in cohort one. So I'm just gonna say that again. The superintendent's agreement will not be with CDS. It will be with the superintendent where that child lives and the superintendent of the program in cohort one, so the collaborative program. I think we have two collaborative programs. So Scott, that would be you, correct? And then Sue Terrell. Any questions about that process? Can I ask one clarifying question? Sure. Surprise. <laughs> um, <laughs> There are going to be those those cases where uh, the child is in the residential um, uh, SAU, but has not the family has not had any contact with their SAU, um, and so in those cases, it's still a superintendent agreement, but there's likely going to need to be an introduction of at least the students' uh, uh, awareness. The, the the residential SAU is going to be need is going to need to be made aware that the student exists, and that they're going to be attending for just like a superintendent's agreement, one year. And that is going to be a superintendent agreement that would be revisited um, because I think one of the things we could anticipate is there could be a case where that residential, that residing district comes on as cohort two and the family, and they may want to have that FAPE offer. So at the time that you're entering into that um, that agreement, it'll be important to be clear that the superintendent agreement, just like K-12, is a one-year only, correct? We have had um, some of the SAUs ask for a letter to be drafted to go with the superintendent's agreement, just to clarify with the families that this is a one-year and that the expectation is that they will return to their sending district. So um, Lou Collins is drafting that for us and we will have that to our SAUs as soon as possible. And I see Gail has a question. Yeah, we actually have that situation where there is a superintendent's agreement for a child to attend a pre-K, public pre-K okay. program out in one of our uh, cohorts, districts. The question I have is it's a process question. Who's running sort of the, the meetings? Who's doing all of that? Is, would that be CDS since the um, child really is not living in that district? Or is it the SAU where the child is now attending the pre-K? Are they sort of taking over that FAPE obligation? Yes. So the what that superintendent's agreement does is it gives the, the district where they're attending the FAPE obligation. Okay. They're getting the funding for that. They are now in charge of the FAPE special education programming and services. Great, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I think next on the agenda is Paula to give us some updates from our fiscal team. Hello everyone. Just wanted to uh, take a few minutes and clarify some questions about the counts and the funding. At this time, each of, co each of the cohort one SAUs have received your quarter one funding allocation, which is one fourth of the calculated total for the counts that we estimated you would have for uh, in your cohorts for this first quarter. We know that the counts are going to either go up or down and that in some cases, because of what we just discussed, the superintendent agreements uh, that you didn't know you would have, that is going to increase your counts as well. The plan to provide the funding for the change to your counts, including additional students that are coming to your Cohort one pre-K is 
to, um, sorry, there's some. Can you guys give me just a few minutes, please? Sorry. <clears throat> um, the plan is to have all of the, the counts updated on the first day of each upcoming quarter. So October 1st is the day that we will retake all of your counts for who is actually attending your cohort one program. And that's where we will find out all of the additional ones that have come over from us with a superintendent's agreement. And we will recalculate based on that count. And then our hope is to be able to have the funding available to send out around the middle of the first month of the first month of the next quarter. <laughs> um, but keep in mind, I can't promise that. Um, so the counts are going to take place on that day. Where are they on October 1st? And so who do you have on October 1st? Who do you have on January 1st? And who do you have on April 1st? That's how the counts are going to work. Does anybody have any questions about that? Yay. Well, so second to us, Paula, sorry. It's me oh, again. Sorry. I'm the I speaking bet. wheel today. Um, are you pulling the counts from the CDS sync database? Because we just actually worked with them this week and realized that they're missing several of our students. So as far as the counts go for this first year until we get a system well established, uh, you're going to work closely with Jen Hawkins, who is going to work closely with you and sync and also our um, state um, student information system. So all three things together, and we're going to hopefully come to an agreement on who you have. We will verify uh, to ensure that the counts are accurate and the funding is also therefore accurate. Okay. And one more okay. question. And this is just a, a plea to maybe consider getting student numbers, student ID numbers so that we can include them in our district database or should. Um, you should have them registered and they should be entered into um, Synergy. So right. that's how we're going to pull numbers. And so these, we're going to double check. These students should all be enrolled in your student information system and then uploaded to the state system, which means they will have a student ID, a main student ID. So our kids that are in our public pre-K are in our system, but the kids that are in private pre-Ks that are on our CDS list. If So are, when you talk about the, the system, are you talking about like what, what we're using for our special education system? Or are you talking about our yeah. district-wide system? I'm talking about your district-wide system, I believe. Is Kathy Warren here? So I can, I can, I can speak to that. Beth, any child that you are serving, <laughs> and should be enrolled in your district. Okay, that is news. Yep. So, and, just, yeah, oh. and just to, to clarify and kind of bridge some of the data, data to system. Uh, so a lot of our students who had been served prior to this year, all of them were in sync. Um, and, you know, obviously that's where a lot of that, all, that's where all the data was pulled to get the initial counts that we used as of July, I think 22nd or 23rd, which is what we used to sort of establish the count for the first quarter. As you may recall, for the October 1 count, um, that's where we're going to true up and for the only time would true down. So if, for instance, you were expecting 50 students based on that Ju July 23rd number that we had from SYNC. And since then it's gone down to 48. The October one count will be the only time that we ever true that number down. Subsequent to that, if the numbers go back up again, we'll true up. And if they come down even more, we stop at that 48 number. So just to clarify with that, in terms of where the student's information is from SYNC into the local system, the 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 plan is, I believe, that we did not ever want our cohort one SAUs and folks to have to live in two systems. And so assuming that most SAUs had a local IEP management system, 
we assume that once the students were enrolled in your student information system, then they would also then have their IEPs managed locally in that system. So that may have been more explanation than what was required, but that was sort of the history coming into it. Yep, and I just wanna to add to that, the only children that we will not capture from the um, school information system it are the children in the evaluation process. And for that, Jen will be sending you probably a spreadsheet to fill out with that information so that we're capturing that number for each of the SAUs in cohort one. Very good explanation, both of you. Thank you for that. Uh, I would also add to that for the child find students, just so you're aware, we are putting something in writing that we're going to get out to you that hopefully explains all of these points that we keep mentioning in in the, these meetings, uh, because I know it's hard to to maintain a lot. And so having something to look at in writing will be useful. Hopefully next week we'll have that available. Um, but as far as child find goes, just so you're aware, if they're in child find and there is a signed parental permission to evaluate, but they have not been evaluated yet. That's the collection that we need that Jen will collect, and we will be providing one thousand dollars per child for that in that in that quarter. It, once they become be, get evaluated, and if they have an IEP, they will then transfer the count will transfer to the regular funding calculation, and we will add the funding accordingly. If the child find uh, evaluation does not end up with an IEP, then we, you you still get the the one thousand that you had already been allotted, but there won't be any additional funding. I hope that's clear. Um, the other thing I wanted to oh, data. So uh, the collection of data, uh, the data team, Kathy Warren and Kim Hall are working very diligently to get information out about how to enroll all of these students. Uh, within the state information system. It's it's going to be very, it's going to be the same as what you're doing now, except we just need to make sure that you identify them properly as a pre-K with an IEP, with special ed. So that also will apply for, will uh, apply for any superintendent agreement students. They also have to be enrolled. And in the system, it will say that it's a superintendent agreement which moves the subsidy count to this district. So we will know that this is, that this cohort is receiving the funding for this. Um, any other questions about counts and how we're doing that? So I know people have been asking, they have been reaching out because they have more students now from a superintendent agreement in this quarter. But again, we update that in the first day of the next quarter, and then you will see additional funding at that time. Okay, the only other thing I will briefly mention because we're putting together documentation to make this a little bit easier to understand is um, this This is the first year, as you know, pilot, you're all guinea pigs, I mean, helpful in helping us to get this going so that we can help everybody. Um, so we're learning as much as you are and we want to work together to make it work for, for all sides, especially the, the children that need the supports. Um, that being said, the funding that we have calculated, we really don't know exactly how much that's going to cover. So what we refer to as high cost in district, high cost out of district supports, we don't know if some of those are already covered in the calculation, likely some of them won't be. The best way we will, the only way we're gonna know for sure is to collect documentation about what those costs are. So we are preparing a way for you to, for your districts through the business manager to send us invoices, contracts, as well as we're going to need the IEPs to review to ensure to to uh, determine what costs are necessary, and then also we'll we'll use that information before cohort two starts to determine if our funding calculation is even accurate or not. So I hope again I I know that's not a Great answer. The other thing I would say, if if you're already having funding problems with the amount that we've given you, 
reach out to us so we can see what's going on, but you're gonna need to provide us information about why it's not enough already. That's all I have today. Back to your regular programming. Any questions for Paula? No, okay. Uh, the next agenda um, I have to do a little correction on. We are working on setting up office hours for technical assistance and professional development. The first one that we are scheduling will be on September 26th from 3.30 to 4.30, so save that date. But the topic is not developmental delay. We're actually going to do the post, the child outcome measurement sur survey. Is that the right word for us, Susie? system? Child outcome summary process. Summary process. So, and then the next one will be developmental delay. I know that that's been a topic that um, cohort one schools have been asking for more professional development on. So we will correct that and put that in the email that goes out after this meeting today. Hey, Sandy, could I add a little bit to that. I, I was just thinking that, um, you know, we had a presentation on the child outcome summary. It was a really an orientation to generally what, what that process looks like. And the subsequent training um, will be about the, the data that we collect from that process so that everybody understands what's being collected and how that can be used. But um, in the meantime, they're probably, we, we should probably send out the information uh, for the training of the teachers on the COAST process, the eight modules that ECTA offers so that their um, teachers and those who are gonna be involved in, in actually doing the COAST process and getting those entry scores are prepared to do that. So can I was thinking we would add that to this letter, the note going out. So I don't know, it, is that okay? Yeah, I know I'm doing absolutely it do that. asking for permission in front of everybody, no. but um, I think that's a good plan to give people more heads up and more time to um, engage in that. Yeah, so the target audience it, uh, will be teachers, case managers, people that are working with children that are coming to the meeting and talking about this process. Yes, for the for that training, for the eight module mm -hmm. training. And then for the session, the cohort session on the 26th, it's everybody here. No, so that it would just, know. it would not be, I don't think superintendents necessarily need to be there for that. Okay. It would be those that are working with children, special education directors, those that need to know how to report out. Okay. okay. Business managers don't need to be yeah. there, superintendents, right. et cetera. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yep. And just another reminder, I know Jen put it in the chat, but please remember to sign up for the trainings on the BDI or the DAISY. And if you haven't already, send her your invoices for those assessments as well. Anything else from our team? Yeah, I had a um, request from special ed director here who knows that Colette Sullivan's office hours are in conflict with this meeting. And so um, if you could just, what I'm trying to do is kind of arrange for a meeting after this meeting, if people are interested in it with Colette and the team, and also to include probably Sandy and myself in case, and Susie, in case any pertinent preschool questions come up. So I'm wondering if you're interested in that. It doesn't have to be just special ed directors, by the way. Beth, I know you love a good IEP, so you guys can come to it as well, but it is an office hours that, um, you know, her, the monitoring team does. Can you just pop in the email, in the chat before you leave, if you're interested in that uh, four to five is an option for that. It would be kind of a repeat of the office hours that um, Colette did from three to four. What day is that on, Erin? Could you clarify that a little it's bit? It's on, uh, it's, I think it's like twice a month on a Wednesday. 
So it's in conflict it with conflicts this with meeting. this meeting. Yeah, yeah. those uh, and I had one director say to me, Aaron, this and when I tried to get Colette to change it, that it's so like planned out. And also there's guest speakers and things. So we're going to try to get the guest speakers to do an additional session. But we also thought like it might be really helpful for you all to have like specific um, you know, IEP questions, like the scenarios that Susie's going through and like the conversation we had today with Beth, you know, so just let me know if that's something that you're interested in and we can um, arrange to do that and that people find it helpful. Um, I will remind everybody though, that um, Colette's, all of her, her office hours are recorded, I believe, and available. However, if you're like me, going back and watching a recording, it's just rarely happens unless Megan tells me I have to. I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's just a joke. <laughs> all right. Okay. If there aren't any other questions, I think we are all done. Have a great week.